Have you ever wondered why the Apostle Paul calls love, patience, and kindness fruit of the Spirit instead of just character traits or attributes? Tim Keller contends that gradual growth is key to understanding the nature of how Christians change to become more Christ-like. Join us now as Dr. Keller teaches on the fruit of the Spirit. After you listen, we invite you to go online to gospelandlife.com and sign up for our email updates. When you sign up, you'll receive our Life in the Gospel quarterly journal with articles that feature how the gospel is changing hearts, lives, and communities, as well as highlighting other gospel-centered resources. Subscribe today at gospelandlife.com. Galatians 5, and I'll read verses 19 to 26. And just to warn everybody, because this week I had not, not three, not two, not one, not four, but count them five, I rate communication saying, I don't like the fact that you never cover all the material in your handout. Uh, it's like putting stuff on the plate, and then I start to eat it, and then you take it away before I'm finished. And I said, okay. Uh, I want to warn you ahead of time, I will not finish it, but we will get to the last part on temptation next week. This week, let's read Galatians 5, 19 to 26. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who, are, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Okay. Here ends the reading of God's Word. Self-control. Some people said, yeah, it's the last of the fruit of the Spirit. It comes last. And that's my experience, too, a lot of you say. You know, the love, the joy, the peace, but self-control, way down the list. In a sense, it can't be the last, because as we've been saying all along, and we will show you again this evening, the fruit of the Spirit is a singular word, a singular noun. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience. It says the fruit of the Spirit. Because there is one fruit, which is the holiness that comes to us out of God's own nature when the Spirit comes into our life. The Spirit of God is a loving Spirit, yes. It's a, it's a joyful Spirit, yes. It's a peaceful Spirit, yes. And it could be called peaceful Spirit or joyful Spirit, but that's not the, the word that uh, God uses to describe uh, him, he calls him the Holy Spirit, because that, above everything else, describes what it means to be a Christian. And the holiness is like a diamond, and it has many facets, and love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, and so on, are all just aspects of holiness, and they, they have to exist together. They all stimulate one another. They're inverse, uh, they're, they're two sides of the same coin, as we see. They all work together, and therefore, though you, one of them may be leading in your life, and one of them may be lagging in your life, they have to all come together, eventually. They're all attached. They might be on rubber bands, so one can come in, the other one stretches before it catches up, but it can't be disconnected. And that's very important, because you can manufacture self-control, as we're going to see. You can have a kind of self-control that is nothing more than just willpower, and has nothing to do with love or joy or peace. Uh, self-control it, it isn't derived from, and flows, that, that doesn't flow out of love, joy, and peace, isn't self-control. You know, if some poor person, you know, because of your background and your childhood, if your poor little, rod, if you know, you think of your, your uh, uh, life as sort of a, a little iron rod, it was bent, you know, to the left. Sure enough, if you just take the same kind of power, you can bend your life back to the right, you know. After a while, it breaks. I, I, a friend that, uh, uh, that Terry and I both know, he tells a great story. His name is Frank Barker, and he's a pastor in Alabama, and he tells this great story about how he tried to, give his wife self-control. As he said, when we first got married, his wife was deeply depressed. Uh, he, she went into this dark, deep depression. She was discouraged. And he said, boy, I'll tell you, I counseled her. I did everything I possibly could to help her. Every single day, I walked in and I looked at her and I said, fuck up! <laughs> but he says, nothing helped. Except, <laughs> except he did it, you know, he's got, this, he's got this, this old Alabama accent, so he would say, I'd say, fuck up! But nothing helped. 
you know, and so, uh, and of course he was making fun of himself, and he was essentially saying that when I was a young man, I thought that self-control kind of existed by itself. I, I thought that it could just be done. You could just reach down, you know, like all the commercials say, you can reach down and you pull it out. But uh, you see, the self-control can't grow without all the rest. It grows out of the love, out of the joy, out of the peace. It's, it's part and parcel with it. Now, uh, for a moment, as we proceed, think about this. We all have a problem with self-control, right? Everybody here, hopefully, can think of some emotion you have trouble controlling, the tongue you have trouble controlling, uh, a, a, a habit you've got trouble controlling, a relationship hmm? you're having trouble controlling, yourself in the relationship, in a sense. And if you can't think of anything that's out of control, your pride's out of control. Uh, we, just so you know, you've got something out of control. We've all got it. What does the Bible mean when it says self-control? This little word that we read here in uh, Galatians 5 uh, is the word self-control. In, uh, in the old King James, it says it's temperance. What a great word, temperance. We've lost it almost completely. Except we still have the word around, only in a shorter form. We talk about losing your temper, which of course means not being angry necessarily, because you can be angry without losing your temper, as you know. But losing your temper means you've lost control. And it's a Greek word, very interesting and important word, egrotheia, and it comes first of all from the, from the Greek stem krat, which is the word for power, for strength, for dominion, and for lordship. And you see the word krat is put together with the word ego, which is the word ego, which means the self. And so what we have here is a word that really means power, lordship, lordship over yourself, mastery over yourself. And the opposite word in Greek is akratos, which is interesting. The lexicon says akratos is one who has no inner strength and therefore no discipline. Because inner strength and discipline go together. Now, uh, it's important to keep in mind that for the ancient Greeks, now this is important, because a lot of people who think they understand self-control, they, as I just mentioned, that the fuck up type of person uh, who says that self-control is essentially a stoic, essentially not a Christian, but a Greek in their understanding of self-control. For the Greeks, self-control was the ultimate virtue. It was the virtue out of which everything else flowed. It was the highest importance. I put down here Aristotle in his ethics, and you know, his was, his was one of the very first uh, major comprehensive book on ethics, had a huge section on self-control. I can't imagine today someone writing a, a, you know, a book on ethics, he would have dealt with all kinds of things like the you know, dignity of human life and you know, lots of things, but you probably would not have a huge section on self-control. The Greeks believed that the only way that you could be a free and independent person was to have self-control. And you can understand how they would see that. They saw that if you had self-control, everything else followed. The only way, if you have self-control, nobody can control you. And you understand that. You still have that. Uh, people say, never let them see you wet. That's a way of saying, as mean as they're being to you, if you are unflappable, if you are in utter total control, in a sense, they're not controlling you. So you can say, six and stone may break my bones. I mean, what is that? That's a way of saying, you can't hurt me because I am in control of my emotions. I am in control of my temper. I am in control of myself. And so, uh, you know, the Greeks, especially the Stoics, praise self-control as the highest virtue. Total self-control in the area of food, in the area of sex, in the area of the tongue, uh, in the area of the passions. They believe in control for control's sake. And uh, there's a problem with that, as we're going to see. It doesn't work. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a sense in which I can see history in this, in three phases. What, what goes on is, so often in a culture or in a society, there is, uh, the society is often religious when it starts. You can see this. I know that when you go to public school, the textbooks tell you that the Puritans were looking for freedom when they came here. That's silly. Pur of course the Puritans were looking for freedom. It's sort of an accident they were looking for freedom. They were looking to start a Christian country. There's no doubt about that. Uh, every, just about every society that we know, a very culture, civilization has a kind of religious basis, and the people have a religious fervor, and out of that religious fervor comes self-control. You have to control yourself for God. But very often, the next generation has lost that love of God and has lost that, uh, you can see this in, in early, the early history of New England, has lost that passion for God, and now they have the moral without the heart. They have the external morals without the internal monitor. And what you have now is no longer people who have self-control for God's sake, but they're stoic. 
And a stoic is someone who says, I control myself for myself. I control myself because it's good for me. I control myself because it's good for society. It's just good to have discipline because it's good to have discipline. And uh, a lot of our parents were stoics, you know that. A lot of our parents were definitely scared. I, I think it's interesting, uh, I, maybe I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, I was reading in, uh, in Seven Days Magazine a little biography of Keith Haring, the, the, uh, the great artist, uh, gay activist, lived in uh, uh, Greenwich Village for years and just died of AIDS. And they did a, a biography on him. And the most interesting thing to me was that his parents, I know, I know the kind of parents he had. His, I know the family, basically. I don't know them personally, but he was raised in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And Kutztown, Pennsylvania is right down the road from where I was raised. And uh, his parents were deathly afraid when he went through a Jesus freak stage. And he got real active in evangelistic Bible studies and all this sort of thing, and he got really upset about it. And then what happened was he, he got rid of that, and he moved to Greenwich Village and got into the gay lifestyle and into gay activism and all that, and they didn't like that either. See, the point is, his parents were stoic. That is, I want you to be moral, but I don't want you to be religious about it. I want you to be self-controlled because it's good to be self-controlled, because self-control is what you have, you see. You just don't give in to this and that and this. You have self-control. The problem with it is that uh, whereas very often religious people have stoic children, stoic people have Epicurean children. And in the, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the two kinds of people that Paul always had to deal with were the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Stoics said, because there is no real truth, there is no real God, we need to be self-controlled just so we can be authentic people. And the Epicurean said, that's, that's how I feel too, and the Epicurean said, because there is no truth, get out there and have as good a time as you possibly can. What are you talking about, self-control? Like, who's going to get me if I don't have self-control? You know, you know, like if my parents said, my parents say, you have to have self-control, you're a stoic. Well, Dad, you believe in heaven and hell? Well, sure, I believe in heaven and hell. Well, how do you know when you get there? Well, I don't know. I mean, let's not talk about this sort of thing. Religion is a private thing. Oh, I see, Dad. In other words, you really don't know if there is a heaven and hell. Well, I don't know. You know, go ask somebody else. And, of course, eventually the kid says, what's so big about self-control? So religious parents have stoic kids, and stoic kids, uh, kids have Epicurean kids, and Epicurean kids... Epicurean kids are people who are out there dying. That's true. They're dying for lack of direction. They're dying for lack of meaning. In many cases, it's the, sons, it's the kids of the Epicureans that go back to being religious because they realize after a while, you know what? If I don't have God, I don't have me. You can't really have a society without God. You can't really have morals without God. You can't have purpose without God. I can't even have a self without God because the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self, as John Calvin says, they increase and they decrease or diminish together. They're coordinate things. Now, biblical self-control is very different than pagan self-control. In biblical religion, the idea of self-control is clearly present. Of course, we see it right there in the middle of all this other stuff. Right? It's, it, it's clearly part of holiness. It's very important. But uh, it's wrapped up with the rest. It's the opposite of uncontrolled passion or uncontrolled body. Because you see, the works of the flesh that we read had bodily things like sexual immorality and drunkenness, but it also had fits of rage, which is an emotional thing. And uh, self-control is over against being completely out of control in any of your emotions or your habits. In 1 Corinthians 9, 25, and we're going to look at that in a second, Paul likens the believer to an athlete who is disciplined. Why? To win the prize. But Paul says his self-control is for his brethren's sake. Galatians 5 says it's for Christ's sake. Because it says here, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified their passions. That means they've nailed them up there. Get up there, you passions, and you stay there, and you don't go squiggling all over the place and messing up my life. Why are you crucifying the passions? Why are you putting them up there? Why are you putting them in their place? For Jesus' sake, I belong to Jesus. And so the point is, the stoic approach doesn't work in the end. And I put down here in italics, self-control is not something you do for yourself, biblically. In fact... Self-control only comes, only comes when you want something more than yourself. You want something more than your own happiness. You want something more than your own ego. Uh, my, it, it's a hard thing to say, but in the, in the, in the long run, I'm finding that people, you know, let's, let's put it this way. 1 First Corinthians, First Corinthians 11 talks about it. 1 Corinthians 11, 20 in the 20s, late 20s, 28, 29, Paul talks about an interesting phenomenon. He says it's possible, and Jesus talks about it too, uh, it's possible for a person to have a demon cast out of them 
And then to come back with seven brothers, it says, and find the house cleaned and swept and ready for a, a party. And in come the seven demons along with the brother, and the man is worse off than before. Have you heard that? That's a parable. What does that mean? It means it's quite possible to use the self as a way to gain self-control, but in the end, you're just you're buying a little bit of time, but you're digging yourself in deeper. Uh, the, for example, if I can think about this for a moment, or uh, I think we mentioned it last week. Very often, people that are addicted, that have eating disorders, that have uh, uh, drug uh, addiction, and so on, they suffer. And this is true. The, you know, the uh, counselors will look at them and say, "Well, the problem is these people hate themselves. They're down on themselves. They're self-loathing in there." Okay, that's right. So what we have to do is we have to build up their self-esteem. But to make them feel good about themselves, we've got to show them that they are great. And so what they do is they appeal to pride, in a sense, to get rid of little selfishnesses. They try to cast out little selfishnesses by appealing to bigger selfishnesses. Now, we mentioned this last week. It's important, very important. So, for example, uh, I knew a, and this helped her, I knew a woman who had a lot of addictions and went to a psychologist. The psychologist says, your problem is you, you, you do all this because you hate yourself, you're down on yourself. What would you really like to do? Decide what you want to do and then do it. Find out what your standards are and do it for yourself. And she says, what I want to do is I want to run the Boston Marathon. She says, I don't want to win it. I don't want to even place in it. I just want to finish the Boston Marathon. He says, great, do it. And, and she went into training and she trained for two or three years and finally entered the Boston Marathon and she finished. And actually, did that help her, by the way? Did it help her feel better about herself? Uh, did it help her uh, focus her life? Did, was she able to overcome the addictions? In any way? Yes. Was that good for her biblically? In the end, it was a dead end. Because, first of all, it, it, it's only working in the long run, because in the short run, what happened if she didn't finish? Well, I want to know. I think she lucked out. I think, I think she lucked out. She decided, I'm going to do something, and she just happened to catch, she happened, just happened to get a standard she could reach. And we all know, you know, we're in New York, we all have these standards we're you know, going to, and, and a lot of us realize it's Russian roulette to get to them. I mean, those of us who make it say, I got there because I was great, but we all know that there were other people as great as we are that just didn't get there. You know, the wheel, the ball didn't drop. Uh, it's, it's not the way to go. You can say to a little kid, I think we said this last week, you can say to a little kid, get control of yourself, little man. Don't let them see you cry. You should have more self-respect than that. And bingo, the kid gets control of his emotions because he's getting more proud. You've shown him, be self-conscious. Care about what other people think. Put up the image. You think that really helps in the long run? You can't get self-control, really, by appealing to yourself. Marriage is one of the most profound human relationships, but it's one that at times can be difficult and painful. In The Meaning of Marriage, a couple's devotional, Tim and Kathy Keller draw from biblical wisdom and their own experiences to offer a year of devotions for couples. The book is a 365-day devotional that includes stories, daily scriptures, and prayer prompts that will help couples draw closer to God and to each other throughout the year. The Meaning of Marriage, a couple's devotional, is our thanks for your gift to help Gospel and Life share the love of Christ with more people. Request your copy today at gospelandlife.com slash give. Now here's Dr. Keller with the remainder of today's teaching. Uh, and, and I wasn't joking. If you're, it's possible to get your habits under control and it's possible to get your tongue under control by getting your pride out of control. And I know, I know folks, I know people that have been in various addictive uh, situations. In, in many cases, addictions come because people want desperate control. They want control over their lives and that's why they do what they do. And to actually say, all you need is to deal with your self-esteem. You, uh, you, you need to get control of your life for you. In the end, it puts so much pressure on you that uh, in the short run, maybe you'll, maybe you'll make the Boston Marathon. In the long run, you'll be crushed by it. Discipline doesn't happen when you say, you've got to do it for you. Do it for nobody else but you. And a lot of therapy talks like that. That's a terrific amount of pressure. And I think that most of us, in the short run, we can't handle it. In the long run, none of us can handle it. Now... Uh, it's, look, it's center. This is extremely practical. You can't get control for yourself. Here's a summary of it. Center of the first page. The greatest deeds of courage, friends, the greatest deeds of courage are deeds of self-control. Heroes are people who forget themselves. <clears throat> people, see, courage is the ability to say, I don't care about my fears. I don't care about, you know, heroism very often is, are tremendous deeds of discipline. You discipline yourself to see, I've got to get there, and I'm going to, I'm going to ditch my fears, I'm going to ditch my desire for safety, and I'm going to do it. At that point, do they sit down and say, I can do it because I know I'm great? 
they say, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, destroy that foxhole full of enemy snipers and I'm going to rescue my comrades because it's something I really want to do. It's something I want to do for myself. It's a standard I set for myself so I can feel better about myself. Don't be ridiculous. Heroes forget about themselves. And that's why they have such self-control. They're not sitting there saying, for me, for me, for me. No. As we're going to see in just one second, self-control comes when you want something more than yourself. And the more you concentrate on yourself, and, and in fact, the more you try to deal with discipline because you're doing it for you, the less you're going to be able to do it. Extremely practical. Um, quick thing on self-control and culture. No, I don't really have time for it. No, somebody's going to be mad at me. Okay, I do. Never before. <clears throat> Look, I can do this quick. Never before have we had a society with so many problems with self-control. I'm positive that many of the eating disorders we have now, we did not have 50 years ago anywhere. Where's that coming from? The addictions, the drug addiction, the, the violence problems, people out of control. Isn't it weird? We've never had a society where people are more concerned about discipline and getting it in shape and, and, and tucking it in and, and moving on out, you see? And never have we had, have we had more problem with it. The reason is, as I'm saying, is the Stoic approach, that means self-control without God, has fallen apart. We're all Epicureans now, and we're, and we're getting worse all the time. And uh, if, if you want an authority, I, can't, I don't have to go any further than, than our friend Tom Wolfe, who lives right down here in the 60s. And he says, in 1835, our friend de Tocqueville said that people in the United States could afford the extraordinary political and personal freedom that they had only because they were so intensely religious. There was certainly an internal religious monitor in people and throughout the country. You hear that? In other words, the reason the folks had the self-control was they had a religious center. Now, when Roosevelt enunciated his four freedoms, they were, they were three were rather obvious. Freedom of fear, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. The fourth was freedom from want, which was an astonishing idea to Europeans, but it was very much an American notion. Now, if you've had every form of freedom that has been known to man, and then some, the only freedom left is freedom from the internal monitor, freedom from religion. And he says, this is the last freedom that we're, that, uh, we're reaching out for, and it's the reason we're having so much trouble. Because when you get rid of that internal monitor, and you have nothing but stoicism left, it eventually decays. It has to. Because after a while you say, who am I really controlling myself for? And if you say for yourself, as we've just seen, it's inadequate. Now, I'm just going to make a, I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to make a reference. Proverbs 20, 25, 28. Don't, uh, don't refer to it. Don't turn to it. Let me just refer you to three passages I would like to see you study about self-control. Uh, this is my application for the evening. Number one, Proverbs 25, 28 says, Like a city without walls is a man without self-control. Like a city without walls is a man without self-control. When Nehemiah... In, in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3, when Nehemiah heard that Jerusalem had no wall, he wept. Why? Because he knew that a city without a wall wasn't really a city, or it wouldn't be a city for long. Because animals could come in there, and marauders could come in there, and robbers could come in there, and eventually armies could come in there. And he realized that's the way it is. A human being without self-control is not a human being. You've lost some of your humanness. We all need a wall around us. That's what Proverbs 25, 28 is saying. Uh, one way to put it, inside our hearts, remember how we talked about this before? Our hearts are like a seed bed. You know how an acorn has got not just one tree in there, but an entire forest? You know, you can have, there's an ocean of wood in the acorn. One acorn could eventually, could eventually cover the entire world, and, and, and actually, technically, the entire universe with trees. You know that? And, and with nothing nothing but what was in that acorn to start with. In the same way, in every one of our hearts, there are these little seeds. Resentment, which of course, if watered, can become murder. Hmm? Uh, envy, which can become paranoia. Rationalizing, which can become lying. Envy, which becomes robbery. Lust, which becomes adultery. What you need is a wall around us to keep out the marauders that could come in and that are the influences that actually can draw those seeds out. Because, you see, those of us who tend to be resentful, there's aggravating people out there. Those of us who tend to be lustful, there's beautiful people out there. We need a wall around us to protect our seabed. That's what self-control, and that's why it's so important. Uh, secondly, if you look at uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, another passage, don't have to look at it now. I suggest you look at it there because it talks about what it calls their, the cravings of the flesh. 
And the word there for cravings or desires is a Greek word, uh, you know, thelemata, which actually means the commands of the flesh. We forget that one of the things we're up against when, when it comes to the, the sinful nature is the sinful nature has, the sinful nature is an idle manufacturing shop. The sinful nature is the part of you that doesn't want to obey God and doesn't want to worship God, and so it tries to get you to worship anything else. The flesh is that which takes good things and turns them into idols and says, you must have this or you are sick. You must achieve this or you are dirt. The flesh tells you that. And as a result, the flesh actually commands us to do things. That's what that word telemetry means. It commands us. It doesn't just say, I suggest you lust after that woman. It says, you've got to have her. It doesn't say, I suggest that you, uh, if it would be nice to make a few, a few more bucks and climb up the corporate ladder. You say, you are nothing if you aren't able. Look at all the other people that came out of business school at the same time you did, and look where they are. How can you look at yourself in the mirror? And you, stop, you don't even want to hang around with those people anymore because the, the flesh is, is not just saying, I suggest. It's saying, you've got to have it. We do not realize how strong the flesh is. And as a result, Christians in particular are constantly uh, misunder they're, they're miscalculating, they're underestimating the, the compulsive uh, strength of sin. that still is in the, inside us, and Paul's talking about that. As a result, I think a lot of Christians too quickly immediately see any kind of really, really heavy, difficult sorts of sins that are very nagging and very difficult to overcome, almost immediately figure this must be from Satan. Why? Because you don't understand as well as you should, I think, just how wrong the flesh is in making command. Uh, oh, I do believe, by the way, in demon possession, but if you want my personal opinion about it, if somebody sits there and says, I think I'm demon possessed, it's a little bit to me, like somebody coming in and saying, I think I'm mentally, I think I'm severely mentally retarded. I, I've been really studying up on it. I've been reading a lot of books about it. And uh, I, I really wonder if I am. And what do you think? And I, you know, the answer is, if you're really worried about it, you're probably not. And the answer is, the person says, am I demon possessed? I, I got it. Or you wouldn't be bothered by it. You wouldn't know that you are, you see. <clears throat> you wouldn't be sitting around, you know, closing in your right mind. Uh, I, I be certainly I believe in demon possession, just like the Bible says. But I think too often we, we run to it when actually we're, we're under the control of the commands of the flesh. Now, finally, the last thing to say, what is self-control? Now, next week I'm going to talk about temptation. But here's what self-control is. <clears throat> and I'll give you the summary now, and next week we can get back to it in detail. Self-control is the ability to choose the important thing over the urgent thing. The important thing biblically is love for God and love for your neighbor. The urgent thing is to please yourself. And here's the ironic thing. Only as love precedes the urge, to, only the desire to give others joy precedes the urge to give yourself joy will self-control grow and also will joy grow. But the Bible continually says you have to lose yourself to find yourself. You have, to, you have to seek the joy of other people to find joy yourself. The ironic thing is that when we put love first and self second, we find ourselves. Stop looking for yourself. Seek for God and you find yourself. It's very ironic. I mean, the picture that Jesus says you have to lose yourself to find yourself is actually comic. You know, you're saying, oh, I've got to find myself. Don't find me. Don't find yourself, God says. Look for me. But I have to find myself. Look for me. So you're seeking for God. And as you're seeking for God, whoop, there I am. <laughs> that, that's, that's the picture. Hey, I'm looking for God. I gave up looking for myself. I said, I only want you. And for gosh sakes, I found me. When Christ who is our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. When Christ appears, you appear. Uh, so there's two parts of self-control, and here they are. You must clearly envision the long-term goal, the important thing, number one. And then secondly, you have to be able to ditch the competing urges in the trenches. Now, I'll just do this. Let me give you a quick example. Paul... How do you say it? Paul envisions what he wants. He sees the glory of God. Sin, essentially, is an infection of the imagination. You know, for example, you know that there's children starving, right, out there in the third world, but you watch a TV commercial, and the commercial shows you little kids with, with flies buzzing around, you know, coughing and hacking their lungs out, and what has happened at that point is you see what you knew all along. What was on audio becomes, goes on video. Something you knew all along suddenly becomes vivid to you. And when that becomes vivid to you, it controls you, and you give. In the same way, the self-control comes when the important thing is on video, when the important thing 
is, is very real to you. It comes from meditating, it comes from knowing, it comes from thinking, it comes from, from uh, reflecting. When it's very real to you, you find yourself developing self-control. And what should be very real to you? The glory of God, pleasing and giving him joy. The love of God and the love of your neighbor. See, when Paul, in uh, Acts, maybe next week I could read it for you, Acts 23, there's a place where Paul is slapped when he was in, on a trial. He was on trial, and he slapped. And he turns around, and the person who ordered him slapped, he says, maybe God will, use, will slap you, you whitewashed wall. And somebody turned to him and said, you know who that is? That's the high priest. Of course Paul knew that was the high priest. And then he suddenly said, oh, and he quotes Exodus 22, verse 28. And he says, oh. He says, that's right, it is written, you shall not revile a ruler of your people. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have Exodus 22, 28 on the tip of my tongue. The reason Paul snapped out of his anger was suddenly, on video, came this verse. He knew the scripture that well. He knew God's truth that well. And it came up, and it snapped off his anger. He got self-control because on it came. He knew the Bible that well. Do you? Do I? That's why we don't have this kind of self-control. So it has to be on video. You have to clearly understand it. And then secondly, when you're actually in the trenches, that means at the moment,